for the technological issues that are going on. And um, I wanted to thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this great conference. I was uh, very happy with uh, some of the speakers that we had earlier in this conference and, and earlier today um, talking about agriculture and climate change, talking about a project in Maryland um, that I was able to participate on briefly, the, the farming systems project and um, the results that we're seeing with utilizing regenerative systems and especially regenerative organic systems in how we can impact uh, and increase soil carbon by optimizing the biological processes that are involved in that. And so with no further ado, I just wanted to talk about this whole idea of regenerative organic agriculture and what that means. When we're talking about regenerative organic agriculture, this is really an innovative, integrated and dynamic type of a system. What we're focusing on is soil organic matter and soil biodiversity and the, the content of the organisms in the soil. We're looking at holistic farming and grazing practices. It's a whole system that we're focusing on and not focusing on um, all of the issues that it is that we see, but really focusing on the problem. And that problem we'll talk about uh, throughout this presentation, but it really is the problem of the fact that we don't have enough soil, we don't have enough carbon in our system. So how is it that we're going to be able to regenerate the soil? And that's going to help us to improve our water cycle and our fertility. It's going to help us to have enhanced resilience and improve the nutritive quality of the products that we're producing. And what we're doing is we're actually utilizing the power of photosynthesis. We're utilizing the energy that comes from the sun and utilizing that in, a, in both a subatomic and an atomic level of energy flow from the sun through carbon into plants, microbes, and animals, really getting that interwoven complex yet elegantly simple repeated pattern design matrix where we're all following all of these biological organisms are following the same rules and design, but it's all in a complex interwoven system that we're looking at. So what we wanna do again is really focus on what I see as the sole problem in agriculture. And that problem is that we do not have enough soil. We need to regenerate the soils. And soil by definition is carbon, hydrogen and oxygen bound to the uh, mineral matrix of sand, silt, and clay. So it's essentially organic matter bound to sand, silt, and clay. And we didn't have soil. Soil didn't come from space dust. We didn't have soil when planet Earth originated. What we had was we had a land base and we had an aquatic environment. And what we needed to do in order to create soil is to have this interaction between the microbial community, in particular, the mycorrhizal fungi and the plants in order to be able to do this. And actually, this was even before we had land plants as we see today. So initially, what we had in this aquatic environment was mycorrhizal fungi, the precursor to mycorrhizal, common mycorrhizal fungi, that interacted with a photosynthetic bacterium in that aquatic environment where the two organisms joined together to actually enhance the activities and the resources of both of them so that they could replicate and grow to a higher level, which then allowed them to wash up from that aquatic environment onto the shore. And as they broke down, starting to build that organic matter and starting to build soil in that environment. So what you had initially was you had this relationship in which you had a single celled bacterium that was floating around in an aquatic environment and it could only do photosynthesis. It needed elements from that aquatic environment, nutrients and micronutrients in order to be able to make all of the enzymes that were involved in photosynthesis. And it would only be able to absorb those when it would encounter them in the aquatic environment. And if you're a small single celled organism, the amount of times that you encounter, especially micronutrients is very small. But if you actually join together with a fungus whose body is more like long arms, this fungal strands, the hyphal strands that are out there, these long arms that can go out and reach out and grab onto those nutrients that are in, the, in that aquatic environment. 
And that's going to allow you to be able to be more efficient at grabbing onto those nutrients. And then you can use them to make the enzymes to do photosynthesis. And again, once they started doing this, both organisms could replicate at a much higher rate because they could fix more carbon. And so then they would wash up on shore. And as they washed up on shore, what would end up happening is that the, the um, tides would only take them so far into shore. And so they would start to build up in a certain area. And as they started to build up in that area, the organisms that were at the bottom, the photosynthetic organisms that were at the bottom, those photosynthetic bacteria needed to have a different job because they wouldn't have access to sunlight anymore. And so they started to form an anchoring structure, which is what we see as modern day roots. That's basically gonna be able to hold those organisms in place. And as they work together in that consortia, they essentially built up what we now see as large scale land plants. So it was this complex interaction between the fungus and the bacterium that led to the evolution of land plants. So we had no plants without fungi and we had no soil without plants. So we have to have these things together. And when we're looking at, again, regenerative agriculture and regenerative organic agriculture in particular, it really is having this connection between the uh, plants and the microbial community. It also is really important that we are also including animals into this system. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that animal, that animal inclusion in just a minute. But what I really want us to do is again, focus on a systems approach that starts with photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the most efficient form of solar energy conversion to chemical energy. And it's gonna hold that energy in the bonds between carbon atoms and carbon atoms and other atoms. And so you get these green leaves that are actually essential to all life on this planet providing the carbon for almost every organism on the planet comes directly or indirectly from this photosynthetic activity. And this photosynthetic activity is enhanced by the relationship with the microbial community where it is that you're gonna be able to get better access to those nutrients. So again, focusing on the fact that what we have is really a carbon problem soils deficient in carbon. And what we can do is we can change this in a relatively short period of time. So this is an example from a farmer in the US in Ohio. And these are soils from the, the soil that is dark and rich is the soil that comes from the farmer's field. And this other soil is on the other side of the fence row. So originally, um, the soil in his field probably looked that dark, rich structure that's there. But over time with agricultural use, what we've done is we've depleted the organic matter in there. And so his soil started to look like the other soil that you have there, the soil on the right. And so what we wanna do is we wanna be able to have that dark, rich material, that organic matter come back in. And so this farmer has used regenerative practices in order to be able to increase that amount of carbon that he has in his soil. And so now his soil looks like it does on the left instead of like it does on the right. And he's done this over, it's, it's taken time, he's done this over 30 years, but looking at some of these practices that farmers like David Brandt have had in place and working with the biological tools, it is possible for us to be able to do this in an even shorter duration than the 30 years that we're looking at. And that's what's really exciting about regenerative organic agriculture. What we've done is we have lost carbon from our soils. And even when we go through and modify practices that we are introducing reduced tillage or no-till types of practices, there's only so much that the reduction of tillage can do if we're not having that influx of carbon that comes from the plant, if we're not recharging and regenerating the system from having that photosynthetic activity. So that's, again, where I wanna show that this is key. Yes, 
reduction in tillage may be a component of this, but for us to get our carbon levels back to where they were, we need to be able to regenerate and reinvigorate with carbon. And what we're seeing with carbon is that we're seeing a new viewpoint from the view of researchers, but this is really helping us to understand what's happening with farmers and ranchers. What we had traditionally before was that we relied on organic matter that was highly decomposed, that was this persistent organic matter that would be the organic matter that would contribute to soil regeneration. But what we're finding is that we don't have to have that very resistant organic matter. And the key with this is that very re resistant recalcitrant organic matter can take hundreds of thousands of years to form because it's a decomposition product of the breakdown of carbohydrates and proteins that are going into the soil. And what we want to see is we want to see if there are ways in which we can have organic matter that isn't mostly this breakdown product, but actually the emergent view now is that we're seeing organic matter that comes from the biological activity. It's actually the biological activity that is both physically and chemically occluding or keeping that organic matter stabilized so that it doesn't break down very quickly and go back up into the atmosphere as CO2. One of the challenges that we have with trying to grow organic matter in our soils is that to do this, we wanna have biological activity, but those organisms are going to be respiring CO2. They function very similar to us where we take in carbohydrates or, or food that is carbon-based. And as we consume that food, we are going to be respiring or giving off CO2. And so a very small amount of that food that we consume actually ends up as part of the carbon matrix of our bodies. And if we're trying to regenerate soil, we need to keep as much of that carbon locked in the soil as possible. But we know that in order for that carbon to be locked into the soil, it requires biological activity. And so if the biological organisms are respiring CO2, how does that work that we're actually increasing carbon? And so what the, these researchers have found in looking at organic matter is that the biology isn't just having to break down that carbon into that recalcitrant form that is very stabilized and takes a long time to break it down and loses a lot of CO2 in that process, but we can take forms of carbon that aren't as stabilized by decomposition and stabilize it by the microbial processes. So by putting that carbon inside aggregates or pellets in the soil, by binding that carbon into what are called organomineral complexes, where we're actually binding the organic matter to something like a clay mineral or binding the organic matter um, to various types of cations in the soil and creating an organic matter, cation organic matter complex that's actually able to hold that organic matter for a longer period of time. And so when biology is doing this, it's taking carbon that we're putting in on an annual basis that we're putting in continuously with plant growth and actually converting that into the stabilized carbon that can be part of the soil matrix that we're trying to build. So it's really important for us to be able to see that we can do this and get the understanding of how we can increase soil organic matter in our lifetime. So how do we go about being able to increase soil organic matter in our lifetime? One of the big things that I want us to focus on, we talk a lot about principles of soil health and the principles of soil health, we'll talk about them, but one of the things that I think can make it a little bit easier for us to think about is to treat the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves. The soil, if we think of it as a living organism, this complex environment of all of these billions of different microbial communities, we're actually going to have to think about it as a living matrix. And when we think about that, again, all living organisms follow some very simple basic rules. And so if we treat the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves to be healthy, we can have healthy soil and that can then 
contribute to producing healthy food, which will rise to healthy people. So the first thing is one of the things that we're, we're taught to do to be more healthy is to eat small meals throughout the day, to be a grazer, which means that we're almost giving our bodies, our gut microbiome, a food source on a continuous basis so that, that those microorganisms aren't going through phases of having a whole lot of food and then not having food. So you're going through um, abundance to starvation, abundance to famine. And those cycles are very hard on organisms to go through. So instead, what we wanna do is we wanna be able to have small meals throughout the day. What this means for the soil is having a continuous influx of carbon. And that influx of carbon is coming from a living plant. So the more we can have living plants, even in Canada, the better off that we're going to be. So instead of thinking about how short our growing season is, how can we maximize the amount of time that we have plants that are growing there? How can we get it so that we have 365 days of the year? How can we get it so that even in Canada, we're using 250 to 280 to 290 days to actually be growing food? for the soil. It's not always about just growing food for us, but growing food for the soil. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna increase the amount of plant growth that we have. We are going to add diversity, having a diverse diet where you're consuming carbohydrates, you're consuming proteins, uh, you're consuming um, antioxidants and polyphenolics. Uh, complex carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, all of these different things we know is important for us. It's also important for the microbial community because those different components are going to feed different organisms. And that's gonna enhance different types of activity that are going to be really important for the community to be able to function. And so you get different players, different organisms that are gonna be fed at different times. And that's gonna allow for a whole interactive community function. It's not one individual organism that we're looking at, but it's the diversity of organisms that we're looking at. And to have a diversity of organisms, we need to have a diverse diet. What this means is that we need to have diverse plants growing. Again, this goes back to where that diet, where that food comes from. That food comes from the plants. We need to have the diversity of plants growing. So when we have monoculture-based agriculture, that is something that's not giving the soil a diverse diet. So we're stimulating very few organisms and reducing the overall functionality of the soil. So what we wanna do here is we wanna have diverse crop rotation or and or introducing cover crops or companion cropping, having two crops growing at the same time, doing things like relay cropping where you have one crop that's gonna be growing and immediately uh, after you plant and get one crop growing, you can plant another crop. Um, you can have double cropping or poly cropping in a similar way where you're going to have two plants growing at the same time and harvest those either simultaneously and um, uh, separate out the seeds, or you're going to be able to harvest them at different times by retooling some of the equipment that you have. Again, utilizing diversity that you may have in a cover crop. If it's difficult to do that with the cash crop that you're growing, what is it that you might be able to do? In a produce production, can you be putting cover crops in as, as mulch uh, in your beds or between your beds, as opposed to having just a, a um, bare surface area or mulching with plastic or other things like that. Are there ways to be able to utilize biology and the plants to be able to get this to function? The next thing is to exercise. We all are supposed to exercise to be healthy. But when we're talking about exercise, it's exercise in which we don't wanna overdo it. We kind of need to think about training our soils for regeneration in the same way that you would train an athlete. When you have an athlete that's training, the athlete doesn't want to work so hard that they get themselves injured. 
but they always want to be able to have additional stressors as part of that exercise. So you don't always run the same distance or at the same rate um, in the same time, but you're changing how it is that you're responding. And so this exercise is really important. And what we can think about is the frequency, the intensity, the scale, and the timing of the exercise. How do we make sure that we're exercising, but we don't over-exercise, we don't do things to injury? What this means for agriculture is having certain stressors. And there are always going to be stressors in agriculture. Climate is something that we can't control, and it's becoming even more out of control. So that's automatically a stressor that's going to be there. But having issues with fertility and pests and disease issues, as long as we can manage them in such a way that they don't get out of control, we're actually able to provide that level of exercise that is going to be important for adding a little bit of stress and making the system work. We want the plants to actually have to do some work and perform. And what this means is when they have to work, they have to give off exudates to feed the microbial community so that they can get the nutrients that they need from that soil environment. The other thing that we can do to treat ourselves well and treat the soil well is to protect from injury, radiation, temperature extremes, et cetera, putting on an armor. This is important in the soil environment because that fragile soil environment needs protection that can come from living plants or from residue and making sure that we have that protection on that soil surface. We're always going to be exposed, the soil is always going to be exposed to a certain amount of stressors, again, a certain amount of radiation that's going to get in, a certain amount of temperature extremes. But if we can buffer that in some way with how we're going about managing it, that's going to be far more beneficial. So again, what we want to think about is think about the soil as a living organism and how can we utilize the various types of principles that we've talked about with soil health, that have been talked about with soil health, that can be really important for how we're going to treat the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves. So what I've done here is I've actually taken some of the principles that we have for soil health. Um, typically, there's about four or five principles that are talked about for soil health. I use six of them, and I've put them into this uh, pyramid design. And I've used this pyramid design for a couple of reasons. One is that in a pyramid design, um, we have pyramids that have stood for thousands of years. And the pyramid stand that have stood for thousands of years are pyramids that have been completed. And they're pyramids that have that resiliency and redundancy of structure and the inner woven structure that actually helps them to stand. And I want your agricultural system to not just stand for centuries. I just don't want you to celebrate a, a century um, birthday on your farm, but I want you to be able to celebrate millennial anniversaries in order to be able to see that you're actually keeping that resilient, redundant system functioning. And so when we talk about these various types of principles that we have here, we want to be able to have principles that are going to help us to intensify the system. We're going to look at this, what's called eco-functional intensification. We're going to be looking at how we're going to be able to utilize the system to its greatest level of efficiency. We're going to optimize the landscape use. We're going to maximize the efficiencies of water and fertility in that system. We're not gonna have us do a lot more work, but less work, but more efficient work so that we're able to actually get the same function without having to put in a lot more energy and stress into that system. We wanna have energy going in in the form of carbon and you wanna have stressors to be able to exercise, but again, we don't wanna injure the system. We also can help to create multiple enterprises so that it is something that in intensification, we're not just growing one crop, but we're growing multiple crops or we're utilizing the system in a different way. We want to make sure that we understand that this is a biological functioning system in which trade-offs are going to happen. Everything costs. 
But when we're doing this, we are, we are spreading the costs among billions of organisms in the soil, as opposed to having the costs all be put on the producer so that we're able to have something that is going to be far more profitable, that is going to help us to achieve economic and environmental wealth. We're gonna redistribute that risk. And then at the same time, that's gonna help us to improve nutrient density. So the other reason that I wanna talk about this in a pyramid design is again, that interaction between the principles. So we talked a little bit about maximizing photosynthesis. Again, that's uh, having a continuous influx of food that is that grazing type of, of idea. We talked about diversity in the fact that we want to have diverse crop rotations to stimulate the diversity of above ground and below ground. Um, we want to be able to have the armor or protection on the soil surface. And then we also want to do things where we are going to be reducing or eliminating tillage so that that's another layer of protection so we don't get the soil disturbance that happens with tillage. And we want to be able to manage livestock because that's going to help us be able to manage that carbon flow below ground. And it also is going to help us to be able to incorporate some of the organic matter with hoof traffic and other things like that, help us to introduce various types of biological communities from uh, the animals, the guts, the microorganisms that are in the guts of the animals. But the big thing too that we're kind of missing in some of these principles is this uh, reduced or reduced or no synthetic inputs. And this is really important because this goes back to that exercise. We need to have a relationship between the plants and the microbial community. If we're gonna regenerate soil, we have to originate soil. And soil originated with that relationship between plants and the microbial community. If we put on too much synthetic inputs, what ends up happening is it outsources the job of the microbial community. If the plants don't need to have the microbes in order to be able to be active, then we are losing that microbial uh, activity because the plants aren't going to be feeding the microbes carbon. So we want to be able to make sure that we're going to continue that going forward. Again, keeping things green and growing. We don't have to tell ourselves, we don't have to be convinced by the fact that we have a short growing season and say that this is the best that we can do. We can actually do better. We can get more activity going. We can stimulate more activity. And that is by thinking about the fact that we are, our true crop that we're harvesting is sunlight. And so how do we get more days of the year that we're harvesting sunlight? How are we able to get things like reindeer growing um, in, in living in the Arctic in the wintertime? Because there are um, lichens, there are plants of some forms that are growing that they're able to feed on. One of the things that we're seeing with issues with climate change and what I'm talking about with reindeer starving here is that with climate change, we're getting these freeze thaw cycles, which can be good for getting more plant growth because we have more days of the year now where we don't have as, as uh, low of temperatures, but for organisms like reindeer, they're starving because you get these ice sheets that are formed over that plant material and they can't get down there and be able to access that. So we wanna look at how everything is functioning together. And this is then reducing the function of the plant community because you're not getting the reindeer, you're not getting that animal interaction. We need to think of things in the form of, again, looking at sunlight versus temperature. Temperature for the plants, plants don't have nervous systems, so they don't sense temperature in the same way that we do. And so what we're looking at is temperatures where the plants have optimum biological activity, chemistry that can occur, the biochemistry within the plants. What we need to have if we're going to try and get 260 to 280 to 300 days of plant growth in Canada is looking at different plants so that we're able to get plants that are adapted 
to some lower temperatures, but are still able to harvest sunlight. Again, like the, the plants that are growing in the Arctic, to be able to have those organisms growing to be putting carbon below ground and really being able to regenerate soil. So again, we need to look at things like plant selection, looking at, at new plants and old plants, looking to indigenous communities to help us to identify plants that have been growing in that environment for a longer period of time. We need to be looking at things like relay cropping, double cropping, poly cropping, utilizing that landscape, intensifying the use of that landscape, incorporating perennials and annuals onto the same landscape, utilizing grasses and forbs and oils all at the same time, and keeping things green and growing if we really want to have a carbon economy in which we're building up soil. We're putting carbon below ground. That's your money bags that are below ground in this image that's in the background. So we do photosynthesis. Your cash flow in your agricultural system is based on how much carbon we can put below ground. So again, what we want to do is we want to have that diverse diet of plants that are growing. And when we have the diverse diet of plants that are growing, it reduces what I refer to as the donut diet. The donut diet is when you have a monoculture based type system. It's one type of a food source going into the soil. And when you have one type of food source, we all love donuts, like to eat donuts, love to have donuts all the time. But if we had donuts all the time, we wouldn't be able to function. We'd be a slug on the ground. And that is because we need to have proteins. We need to have antioxidants and polyphenolics and a number of different types of um, carbohydrates, not just the carbohydrates that come, the simple carbohydrates that come from donuts. We need to have all of these complex food sources, that diversity to be able to stimulate the activity of the diverse gut microbiome that we have. And the same thing is true for the soil. If we just feed the soil one particular type of resource by the crops that we're growing, by the monocultures that we have, that is going to only feed a certain amount of organisms and that's gonna reduce the overall functionality. We also wanna have diversity that's gonna help us with weed management. Some of the best ways to be able to control weeds are through competition. So if we have competition and we're choosing the competitor. Weeds are plants out of place and they're plants out of place because nature has decided that that environment needs to have a plant there. If we're the ones who are choosing to put the plants there, nature won't decide that and we can decide which plants that we may be putting into place. We want to be able to have uh, stimulate the microbial and microbial diversity um, in order to be able to improve nutrient cycling, the resilience, disease management, and pest management that we have in there. And we can do innovative things. So this is in North Dakota, where they're actually growing sunflowers, but they're growing a cover crop mix between the, the sunflowers. And what this has done is this hasn't just enhanced the amount of carbon flow that we have, but it also has helped us to manage water better. So you can see in my hands there, you have soil. This was soil from the same day. These were plots that were right next to each other, but the soil that is in my hand on the left-hand side is very dry. And that came from a continuous um, wheat area and the soil that's in my right hand actually came from this area that was had the diverse cover crop and it is wet. And we are actually growing more diverse plants there, but we're managing water far more efficiently. So we're able to absorb and hold on to water and keep water retained in that soil environment. Again, talking about having crop rotation as the most effective means yet devised for keeping the land free of weeds. No other method of weed control, mechanical, chemical, or biological is so economic, economical or so easily practiced as a well-arranged sequence of tillage and cropping. Being able to think about, and this was in 1938, 
being able to think about utilizing biologically based tools to manage the issues that you have. Instead of looking at managing, utilizing chemical and, mecha or chemical and mechanical tools, use biological tools first. We can utilize biological tools that are going to help to enhance diversity by doing things with things like trap crops or insectary strips to stimulate the attraction of various types of predatory insects or keeping trap crops, keeping pest and disease insects away from our cash crops. So both of these are going to add diversity overall to the field but at the same time, help us to manage various types of pests and diseases. So this was a project that was uh, conducted in Pennsylvania trying to manage the brown marmorated stink bug. We're utilizing this whole idea of trap crops and insectary strips, having that plant diversity that is going to help us to manage pests and diseases. Again, managing water use efficiency. So we wanna be able to have water use uh, where we're going to utilize water much more efficiently. Um, in uh, this study was republished in, in Acres magazine, but it was actually originally conducted in, in uh, the 1950s. So it was republished in 2000. That's where the citation comes from, but it was originally done in the 1950s. And the idea behind this was that the drought myth states that it's a case of plant hunger rather than, than thirst. So an unfertilized crop of corn required 26,000 gallons of water per bushel. And even at that level for, for getting plant growth, the yield was four times less than a fertilized field receiving only 5,600 gallons of water per bushel. So the idea is, is that we can improve water use efficiency and productivity if we manage fertility. And in managing fertility, it doesn't mean here that we need to add a whole lot of synthetic nutrients. What it means is that we can actually utilize the nutrients that are in the soil through the biological organisms. So we can grow more, we can have a higher yield in a cover crop mix than when you have single species of the same plants that are in the cover crop mix. So that's the study in North Dakota. And they also tested higher for nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and sulfur. We can improve the porosity. And when we do that, we can improve infiltration rates and we can improve water holding capacity. So a 45% greater porosity increases the infiltration rate of the first inch by 167%, but more importantly, the second inch by 650%. We're not gonna get gentle rainfalls that are going to allow for good percolation in the soil. You're going to get heavy rainfalls in which you need to absorb as quickly as possible the maximum amount of water that you can possibly get. And so what we're also gonna be looking at in, in helping us to manage water is to help us to manage evaporation, having the soil covered, not just by residue, but by living plants. So again, these are in side-by-side -side plots. You can see the temperature differences. This was in North Dakota again, so a relatively cold environment. But you see that where you have living plant cover, the temperatures were about 20 degrees less than the temperature. Sorry, I apologize, this is in Fahrenheit. But then the temperatures that uh, you would see in um, a bare soil area. There was still a crop growing in this environment, but you had bare soil between the crops. Now, the other thing with this is at those temperatures, you actually end up getting more microbial death that can occur. You are getting microbes that aren't going to be active. So maximum activity can happen around 85 to 90 degrees. But as you get to about 110 degrees, you're starting to see microbial death. And so you're not going to have that level of activity that it is that you're looking for.
The other thing that we're looking for in this system is improved nutrient use efficiency. We want to be able to have the microbial communities actually absorbing and fixing and converting nutrients into a plant available form. What we found, research has found over time, is that our nutrient use efficiencies have gone down. The nutrient use efficiencies, especially for synthetic nutrients. So when you add synthetic nutrients, uh, the use efficiency for synthetic nitrogen is somewhere around 30 to 50%, which means that 30 to 50% of the nitrogen that you added ends up in the crop plant. The rest of it does not. For phosphorus, it's 30% is the high. There are some studies that show as low as 10% of the phosphorus ends up being utilized by the plant. Part of this goes with the availability of those nutrients. So when we use more organic sources, that allows for the biological processing that can allow for those nutrients to get released when the plant needs them. So timing is a big key with this. Being able to have adequate amounts of moisture is a big key with this. But if we're managing water by managing the soil structure and the biological activity, we're better off doing this. The big key what these graphs show is that we've had an increase in overall yield. This is global cereal yield over time. Since 1960 to 2000, we've had a, a steady increase in yield. We've done this by adding fertility. We've done this with crop breeding and genetics. But if you look at the graph on the bottom, this is what's called a nitrogen use efficiency curve or a nutrient use efficiency curve. And what you see here is that that curve is going down, which means that it takes more nitrogen added today to produce a bushel of grain than it took in 1960. And the reason this is, is because we don't have soil anymore and we don't have the biological activity. The nitrogen use efficiency for synthetic fertilizers is, has probably always been the same and it probably will never change. But what we had was we had the biological activity that was compensating for that nitrogen that wasn't able to get into the plants. And so that the more we do these regenerative organic practices, the more we're going to improve the efficiency. So over time, between 1960 and 2000, we lost that biological soil connection that actually had in 1960 compensated and provided for probably around 60 to uh, even more of the nitrogen that was needed by the growing plant, 60% or even more, even higher of the nitrogen that was needed. And one of the ways in which this can happen is looking at crops that are fixing nitrogen. So this is symbiotic nitrogen fixation in soybeans. This is from the farming systems trial at Rodale. And what you can see here on the roots is in the conventional system, you see the nodules that are right around the taproot. It doesn't mean that the rhizobium bacteria are absent from the conventional system, but what has happened in this conventional system is that the nodule activity is, is sticking right around the taproot. Whereas in the organic system, you see more fine roots, greater root branching that's happening. And you also see nodules that are all over these different roots. And the advantage of that is that's gonna add nitrogen, not just right around the taproot and feed just that soybean plant, but it's actually gonna help to provide nitrogen for subsequent crops because it's adding more nitrogen to the whole entire environment instead of just putting it with one particular crop. We're also seeing with this greater uh, root development and growth, we also see things like better soil aggregation and better soil structure. So what you see here is you see aggregates that are being formed around the roots. And these aggregates are really important when we look at making sure that those aggregates are gonna stay stabilized. So we've got different cropping systems here. We've got a conventionally tilled, conventionally managed spring wheat fallow system, a no-till spring wheat winter wheat sunflower system, and a moderately grazed pasture. 
And all that was done was the aggregates that were collected at the top were just exposed to water. And you can see that those aggregates blow apart. When the aggregates are formed, they create porosity and open space between those pellets. If you blow them apart, they actually fill in that space with all the fine particles that were inside the aggregate. And so you're not going to get that same level of porosity. You're now going to get a greater level of compaction. You don't have the pore space for good water infiltration, and you don't have the pore space for good water holding capacity. When we do tillage, it's going to break up the fungal hyphal structure. It's going to break up those soil aggregates. It doesn't mean that you have to go to a complete no-till system. But when you do tillage, you need to be judicial about why you're doing it and how much tillage, the frequency, again, it's that exercise. It's the, the frequency, the intensity, the scale, and the timing. How much tillage are you doing? When is it that you're doing it? And to what intensity are you doing it? What type of implement are you using? And then, um, again, how are you timing it with the activity of the microbial community so that we don't get organic matter being burned off as much as we get biological activity that's basically going to enhance that. And we can go to low till or no till types of systems. These are different types of uh, crop, ro uh, crop rollers that you have. There are different types of equipment that you might be able to do to roll down a cover crop and use that as a natural mulch that's going to help to moderate temperature. It's going to reduce the amount of soil disturbance. It's going to retain that armor and protection for the soil surface. All of these things are really important so that we don't lose soil to erosive processes. So we're actually keeping the soil in place. And again, what we want to do here is we want to think about how all of these things can interact and be interlocked into a pyramid that is going to stand for thousands of years. Onto your farmscape, utilizing eco-functional intensification that's going to allow for your farmscape to be able to thrive for thousands of years. By getting that influx of carbon, making sure that we're keeping the system fed, we're feeding the system a diverse diet, making sure that the system has to exercise and do work, helping to add more carbon into the system, helping to add greater levels of microbial community and diversity, helping to reduce the amount of soil disturbance and the disturbance of that microbial community, and helping to protect that soil with armor in order to be able to enhance its productivity. So really what I want us to be thinking about is in regenerative organic agriculture, the key is that we're regenerating the soil. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one destiny affects all indirectly. And so you as uh, producers are a key to this interaction. Soils evolved with the interaction of the microbes, the plants, and the animals. And we too are animals. We are an essential part for how all of this can work. So I wanna thank you for your time and attention today and uh, for your participation in this wonderful conference. Thank you. What a wonderful quote to wrap that up. Thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with, here with us today. Thank you.